Welcome to the Culture and Sports Podcast, where we have discussions about how leadership and organizational culture impact organizational success, team and athlete performance, and the short and long-term mental, physical, and emotional health of athletes. The Culture and Sports Podcast is brought to you by Culture and Sports. Culture and Sports helps sports organizations, teams, coaches, support and front office staff, and athletes understand the importance of leadership and organizational culture and its direct impact to success. I'm Dr. Jeremy Piasecki, and this is the Culture and Sports Podcast. I would like to introduce you to Chase Griffin. He plays quarterback for UCLA football. He earned his Bachelor's of Arts in Public Affairs and a Master's degree in Education in Transformative Coaching and Leadership, both from UCLA. And he also has started his master's in legal studies, entertainment, media, sports law at UCLA Law. Chase is a nationally recognized leader in college athletic and economic empowerment movement. He's a two times national NIL athlete of the of the year award winner. He has over 30 major brand partnerships, including serving as JP Morgan Chase's first college athlete brand ambassador. He is the athlete creator in residence at Range Sports, which is part of Range Media Partners, a student executive in residence at UWG, and he's a fellow at the University of California Investments. You have quite an impressive resume, Chase. Please tell us a little bit about your short, uh, your sports journey. Well, first off, thank you for having me on the show. Um, no problem. We love having yeah. you here. Yes, sir. So my, my first sport was soccer. And that taught me how to train, how to compete. Uh, I remember I used to wear the Ronaldinho's. I was really rooting for Barcelona at the time. It was Messi, Senor Eto. That was my squad. And uh, every single day I would train. And then on the weekends, I'd ball out, have five or six goals. And on Sunday, I'd watch NFL highlights. And I saw LaDainian Tomlinson going off. I remember one game in particular when he had like 250 yards and four touchdowns. And I was like, man, I want to play football and I want to be a running back like LT. And <laughs> uh, my pops was sort of like, well, I don't want you taking all those hits. It, it, it's tough. And and so he's like, we'll try out quarterback. And so I was still playing soccer at the time. Eventually I started playing so like basketball too. But on the side, I was training. And, and tackle football and playing flag football. My parents sort of made a deal with me that I couldn't start tackle until I was 10 years old. And oh, okay. From that first season of Pop Warner playing quarterback, I think we went eight and one, had a really good year, and I fell in love with the position. And oh, wow. Went on throughout middle school, always played quarterback, high school, uh, chose to go to Hutto High School with Coach Van Meter and loved it. It was a one horse town in Hutto, Texas, and the whole town would show up. And it was a real Friday Night Lights environment. I fell in love with the process of representing something larger than myself. And oh, okay. I feel like a lot of the traits helped me throughout my college career, not only on the field, but off the field as well. And then uh, how did you get into your current role at UCLA? So, uh, I mean, I was offered by UCLA the summer before my senior year, and I committed mm -hmm. on the spot. Where <laughs> when I got invited to to go out uh, by Coach Kelly to to go to sort of a showcase camp, uh, I told my mother, "Hey, they offer me, I'm committing on the spot." That's wow, exactly, very cool. That's exactly what happened, and I remember wow. I, I ripped every single throw. Every single throw was on the. <laughs> I'm not even sure if I've had a better camp. Uh, Oh, wow. It, it was the place to be. It, it was a great match of both academics, football, and to this day, you know, until the dream is dead, I think, uh, you know, I can prepare myself for every chance I have to play professionally. Now, um, you played your hardest in that camp. It was probably your best camp ever. Um, obviously, you did incredibly well. Uh, Coach Kelly was like, yes, I want him. Uh, did you sit when you told your mom, yeah, I'm going to say yes, if I'm offered, did you say yes, because it was a chance to play at UCLA or was it a chance because, or you were saying yes, because it was a chance to work with a leader that you wanted to work with? Uh, I think a little bit of both, you know, obviously coach Kelly, uh, coached in the league for some time and, uh, 
he's had a lot of success in the past and, and God willing, we have a lot of success this season. Uh, for me, that was part of it. And then the other part was I would love to go to school in LA and at UCLA in particular, because it has a long history and lineage of athletes who've changed the world and to be, you know, Uh, also, going back, I was born in UCLA, Santa Monica, which is about two miles down down Wilshire uh, from where I live right now. So, a it was a full circle moment, but also, you know, obviously on the football side, uh, things are in a place where I can still reach my dreams, uh, Mm -hmm. and then honestly, just as important off the field, it's a place where I can build the legacy that I want to build in a place that has a history of cultivating that. Nice. And we're going to talk a little bit about that legacy in a few minutes. But first, I wanted to ask you if you could tell us a little bit more about how you got into the NIL space and why is it incredibly important for the future of sports and specifically for athletes? I think NIL is exactly what you described it sort of in the intros, which is it's an empowerment movement. And it was described as something that remedied some of the inequities in the current NCAA landscape by Justice Kavanaugh and the 9-0 decision in, in the ruling in the Austin case. And when we look at what NIO is, there's so much in it, but it's really the first domino on the way to revenue share. And that's sort mm-hmm. of where my mind is at now, as far as when we're talking about legacy, how can I you know, build myself to be in the best position? How can I advocate for athletes to be in the best position uh, alongside politicians, schools, administrators, uh, to make sure that athletes are at the paramount, paramount of interests when it comes to revenue share? And so with NIL, for me, I think I was prepared for it because of my role as a quarterback in a one, ha- one horse town. Uh, Mm -hmm. in in Hutto, where I was getting media coverage every single week. I probably got to UCLA with uh, over 100 interviews of experience, radio appearances, guest appearances, that type of stuff. And so when I got to UCLA, I was prepared. Plus, I'd already worked with brands since I was the Gatorade Player of the Year, the Ford Player of the Year in Texas, and won a couple other branded awards in the state of Texas. And I had a strong sense of self that's only grown throughout my chance to practice it throughout college. And I think I found a formula that works as far as content strategy. And my on-camera work has been getting better and better. So I think as far as being a good producer of content and on the talent side, being someone who can deliver return on investment to brands, I understand that world. And then at the same time, I've been able to advocate, you know, off the field for athletes to have their fair share of the revenue uh, that that's really to come soon. No, that's awesome. Now you've been talking about a lot, um, um, about NIL and, and your experience with it. And we also talked a little bit about your legacy. I understand that you donate a portion of each of your brand deals to the Los Angeles regional food bank. How did you get involved with them? I always look for expertise in anything that I do. If it's a branded deal, I look for videographers who are excellent and have good track record, and I don't tend to switch up. Uh, when when it came to uh, my NIL, I realized, oh, I can make some money. And when I look at my, my overall goals is to build generational wealth early uh, and then go into public service and philanthropy all while maintaining my faith. Mm-hmm. As long as I can do that, I think that I've you know succeeded on sort of the surface level things that I want to accomplish uh, in this lifetime. Uh, when it came to NIL, I'm looking, well, this is part of college. In college, we're here to learn and learn through experience. How can I practice philanthropy while I'm still in college? And so uh, a cause that's near and dear to me is food insecurity. I had teammates in mm-hmm. high school who are part of the reason why I'm even able to be here at UCLA uh, who struggle with food insecurity. And I grew up serving at the Round Rock Serving Center and realized how much impact the food pantry there had on the community of Round Rock. And so uh, here I wanted to find who was best at servicing food insecure. And the LA Regional Food Bank uh, has just been awesome. Uh, The program in particular that I donate to uh, for the most part is the LA USD Backpack Program, 
where oh, okay. schools get where where uh, school or children who rely on their LAUSD schools to feed them breakfast and lunch don't go hungry on the weekends. And so finding someone who's an expert in solving that issue, uh, I think, maximizes the impact that I can make at this current point in my life. Like, please tell me about the impact that um, positive leadership has had on you. I think the most important leader in anyone's life is themselves, uh, because at the end of the day, there, there are so many negative things that people can gravitate to, and there are so many great things that people can go to. And there are always leaders on both sides who are trying to pull you that direction. Uh, I think folks who take ownership and realize that uh, they have the most agency in their life that anyone has uh, is important. So for me, uh, it, it's it's really now I, I view it more from the religious lens where where I see it as more of like the Holy Spirit guiding me or God okay. or, or those teachings that I rely upon. But I also see the onus upon myself to make the choice to to follow that every single day. And I realize that there's things on both sides where you have to balance where some people, you know, they fall off from what they would even normally say that they believe in. And so I think staying true to oneself in every single situation is the true test. And I think that's part of what what struggle is. It's, you know, in what environments can you remain true to yourself? And I think as long as you do that, you grow. Because if, if you're able to remain in control of your wits and, and stay true to what you believe in, then you're not compromising yourself in any situation. So for me, you know, obviously I attribute that to the leadership of my parents and the characteristics and values that they instilled in me. And then uh, my ability to just continue growing uh, on the front of self-control, because I think the secret to anyone's success uh, comes down to their ability to have self-control. Okay. Okay. Now, um, so with all the adversity you've overcome and, and obviously there was resilience, um, that came along with that, uh, was it easy for you to overcome adversity, um, and, and have resilience? Uh, I mean, was it a long journey? Was it somewhere in between? Like, how do you deal with overcoming adversity? Um, and how do you deal with, um, you know, you know, trying to bounce back to a situation, you know, whether it's on the field or, or in the classroom or somewhere else? I think it's a balance of confidence, but also, uh, you know, ha giving yourself a little bit of slack. For for me, like nobody demands more out of my son. Like it, it actually annoys me when things don't go right for me because I, I see it as, well, I have to be accountable for that. Obviously, if it didn't okay. go the right way, I could have done something better. Uh, and I think, you know, that's part of what I view uh, being a man is for myself, uh, you know, as far as being someone who can provide, being someone who can navigate and being someone who can, you know, put whatever operation you're a part of in the best situation. And that's honestly, I think, the view that a quarterback should have. Uh, for me, with adversity, I've gotten better at it over the years. I remember my recruitment process wasn't all sunshine and rainbows. There were times I'd get down and I was like, man, I'm never going to play Division I. I'm never going to play at this school that I want to play at. Uh, but at the same time, the next minute I was like, nah, you're still the best player in Texas. You're still the best quarterback in Texas. You still... and, and then I went out and I did it, you know, uh, right? You know, by, by the grace of God. And, and so... There, there's sort of that belief system where if you don't quit, uh, you finally get to recognize what all of that work and all of those times of doubt were there for. And mm -hmm. I think overcoming that not only makes you a better player, you know, so much of football, uh, you know, I value football, I love football. It's a dream of mine to win a Super Bowl. But I realize that God willing, when I'm 80 years old, me looking back at my life, I hope football isn't the greatest part about my life. Um, I, I I hope it's it's what I learned through football, or what I learned through school, or I learned through NIL, or learned through you know different parts of my life that allowed me to reach my ultimate goals, which is affecting the world in a way that uh, I think aligns with my beliefs and aligns with the love that I want to give out to the world. 
So, um, talking about um, self accountability, uh, obviously your parents were instr instrumental in you uh, learning self accountability and probably holding you accountable. Who were some other people that really helped you uh, strengthen your self accountability? Because you know, for all the listeners, and obviously for you, uh, you know this quite well is accountability while you think it would be everywhere and everyone would have it um you know you know whether it's in sports or somewhere else uh it seems like that there's not a lot of self accountability out there so like who was influential in your journey and and you've already explained why it's so important to you but why did you in self reflection why did that person or those people have such an impact on you being accountable to yourself and to others all the time yeah, I mean, I, I think in the sports world, coaches, uh, teammates, uh, outside the sports world, teachers, uh, but but for me, what's most near and dear to my heart is family. And mm -hmm. my parents played an integral role, but also being the older brother of three played a large role. Uh, having a sister who's two years younger, who's smarter than me, uh, who's <laughs> killing it right now, by the way, shout out Rose. Uh, and then a younger brother who, who's nine years old and was a baby at the time when I was really grown into manhood. Uh, mm -hmm. Those put things in the perspective of, you know, the importance of, of you know, having a family unit and, and being able to provide for them. And of course, you know, I, I wasn't the provider <laughs> in our family, you know, uh, but I, I did watch how that happens and i right. understood that you know my father he's made strides in our family lineage uh to be at where we're at now and i want to do the same way in an exponential way um mm -hmm. and so i think i take pride in sort of molding myself shaping myself and, and uh becoming the man that i want to be uh, mm -hmm. And I think that's that's, you know, going back to my earlier point, that's where responsibility, that's where accountability shows up. And I think having younger siblings uh, sort of puts me already uh, in a de facto mindset of I'm doing this so that I can do better for <laughs> others and uh, realizing that me pushing myself forward, me building a better future for myself is setting myself up to to create a better future for my family and my future family no that's awesome now uh what's rose doing you gave her rose, a shout out yes so so rose just finished a six-week program with jp morgan chase and in, 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 in jp morgan's wealth office and uh she she's about to travel a little bit but she's about to be a junior at stanford and, and she's doing oh wow it. yep that's impressive. That's yep. impressive. So, so when, you know, when there's a UCLA, uh, Stanford game, what, what is she wearing? Uh, I think she knows who to root for. <laughs> <laughs> On the inside or the outside, is she wearing Cardinal red or is she, or, it, or is she wearing your Jersey? No, she, she's pulling up in the room. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, one of the things you brought up earlier was, um, you know, you want to be a huge contributor to your family. Um, and you said, well, you know, you weren't providing, but obviously to be an integral part of your family, just like a team, uh, you know, just like a community, um, what are some things that you did, you know, in your younger life? And then what are you doing now to better build your family? And, and it could just be educationally. It could just be, um, you know, talking to each other, you know, being a bigger brother, um, you know, having things bounce off of you or you even sharing your struggles or or the adversity you're overcoming? Like, what does that look like for you being uh, a major role contributor in your family? Right. Well, being that I was in between 13 and, and 17 while my brother was sort of growing up, uh, I still think with my little brother, that relationship will grow a lot more as he ages, just because the perspective that I'll be able to insight, basically almost at uncle age compared to him, uh, <laughs> will, will translate better. Now, as far as my sister, you know, we're, we're contemporaries and, and uh, I take pride in, in the work that she's doing and how well she's doing. And so I think, uh, you know, as we progress, uh, it'll be sort of, uh, you know, I, I see it as 
her opportunities uh, might be able to help me, but I don't want her to feel any type of responsibility for that. But I definitely, uh, in every single way that I can help her and provide opportunities to her, definitely feel an onus upon myself to do that. And I think uh, that's great practice because, you know, in the future, uh, that that's sort of, you know, you know, as I as I progress to, to creating a family of my own, that's the same responsibility that I'll expect out of myself and, and my ability to create opportunity and quality of life for my family. Now, how does that translate to your role on the field with your team? I think it's very similar. Uh Obviously, the dynamic is a little bit different, but from quarterback to offense alignment, there's a responsibility to trust that they'll allow you to do your job and that they'll help you in every single way to make your job possible. Uh, and in response, you create plays and make plays and execute plays in a way that rewards them for their hard work. And especially in the relationship with skill positions like running backs and receivers, quarterbacks uh, rely on them to make plays, run their routes, do their job. Uh, and they rely on the quarterback to deliver and execute in a way that allows for them to shine. And, you know, as uh, one of my closest coaches, George Whitfield, who, who's who been, you know, my one of my quarterback coaches, my main quarterback coach and, and mentor since I was like 11 or 12, supplying energy. Uh, and, and, and by supplying energy out to to your playmakers, it makes the team go better. It, that's how plays happen. And that's sort of the dynamic that's between what a quarterback can do from the pocket and what receivers can do out on the field. So what you're sharing is that there's a complete trust uh, within your on-field family, you know, that everyone's going to do what they're supposed to. Um, you're trusting the offensive linemen, uh, the offensive linemen are trusting you that you're going to be in the spot that you're supposed to, uh, you know, whether you're handing off the ball or rolling out for a pass or staying in the pocket, uh, you, you know, you have full trust and confidence, um, you know, in, you know, in the running backs and receivers and everyone else on the team to include the defense, how, you know, other than your mentor, you're talking about how did you as athletes, as a team come to that? Because having that type of trust doesn't come easy. I mean, you're literally trusting someone like with the safety of your body at times, because if they just let, you know, a defensive lineman or, or a back through, like you could be crushed and have, have a serious injury, but, but you have blind trust in them. And how's that happening? I think part of it is when you play football, you sort of concede that if you get blown up, you get blown up. <laughs> so I think that that's part of the pack, but uh, I often think about this and sometimes I think to, to driving and how wild it is that we have blind trust and complete strangers uh, that, uh, you know, based on the, the safety and, and responsibility that they're demonstrating their driving that makes it safe for us to drive. Uh, I think on the field, it's the same thing. As long as there's one central goal, which for the offense is get the ball in the end zone, uh, there's a certain level of, of, of trust, but also expected accountability. Um, you know, it's part of the reason why there are positions. You know, there's 11 guys on the field, what, like four or five different, you know, completely different positions and roles. Uh, that's divvied up because one person can't do it all. Uh, from the quarterback position, something that I've learned as I've gotten to college is you can't do it all. You can't make the receiver run the right route. Uh, you can't make the right tackle. Uh, get the block on the wide nine. You you can't, you know, have your running back scan the right way in protection. But what you can do is do your job in such a way that alleviates all pressure from others. And whether that's getting us in the right play, making sure we're pointed to the right guy in our protection, making sure that we over communicate to the receivers, whether it's man or zone, depending on the routes. Uh, these are ways where we can make the job easier for everyone else. And by doing that, we make the job easier on ourselves. So from the quarterback perspective, I think that teaches me things that will translate well to God will and C-suite positions in the corporate world, where, you know, if you give the resources, education, and empower the talent in positions that are integral to you being able to do your job, then it makes your job that much easier and streamlined and easier to execute. 
No, that's that's so great to hear. And and while you were talking about that, I did have a question for you because accountability seems to be a major theme in your life. Um, you know, almost like it was like when you came out of the womb, all of a sudden you're like, hey, accountability, accountability, accountability. So back when you were playing soccer or when you started playing football, I'm sure there were times where um, you threw an interception or you made a bad handoff or, or a pitch or something. And then, you you know, you know, or even if you did throw a good pass, but, you know, the receiver didn't catch it for whatever reason uh, or they they ran the wrong route. Like, when did when did you stop pointing the finger at someone else and being like, hey, I could have actually done better? We could have, you know, discussed it in the huddle better, or I could have been more aware of what was happening down the field. Like, like when did that process start changing for you when you were like, you know, I have to look inside first before I look outside? Well, I'm a big believer that part of confidence is accountability. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is if you think you're confident, you think you're the man, you think that you're in a position to make things pop and shake, uh, you can't say it's the other person's fault if it doesn't go right every single time. Now, as a quarterback, it's also important to be truthful. Like if someone has a drop that they should have caught, get on. Like that, that, that there, right. there is a, there is a responsibility to correct. But at the same time, if you're always blaming somebody else for faults in your life, well, then why are you even living your life? The, apparently, you can just watch it. You know, apparently, <laughs> it, it, if, if someone else is is you know, if their actions outweigh your actions and how your life goes. Uh, I, I think you're not maximizing who you are as a person. And that's not out of disrespect, that's out of respect. Uh, if you're a person who's wonderfully and fearfully created, who I believe everyone on earth is, how can you not walk in that? And and for me, uh, something that's so fundamental to myself and how I respect myself, love myself, and expect out of myself, uh, if I don't expect that out of my teammates, out of my family members, out of the folks around me, then I'm doing them a disservice because uh, I'm not helping them see how special they are. And, and I think part of being a quarterback uh, is, and, and just a man is realizing that the part of respect is expecting great things out of those around you. And if they're not living up to that, doing what you can do to help them get to that point. Wow. No, that's what you said is incredible. Um, it, it really is. I mean, loving yourself, uh, holding yourself accountable, um, you know, you know, speaking through yourself and, and, and ultimately, you know, walking the walk of, of the way you need to, um, you know, just to show what that looks like, you know, that's incredible because if, you know, for you, it just sounds like, um, you're always, uh, doing a lot of self-reflection of who you are and how you could be better. And then your, um, you're having that same expectation out of everyone else. And, and, and that's, that's very impressive. And I'm sure that uh, when your teammates, you know, provide constructive criticism, I'm sure you're not wanting to be like, Oh, you don't know what you're talking about. Like, I'm sure you're taking it to heart. You probably get a little hard on yourself, you know, at first. And then you're like, okay, let me think of what he was telling me and then how I could actually, you know, you know, make a play better on the field or, or something like that. I'm sure you, I'm sure you have a lot of self-reflection like that. Definitely. Uh, yeah. So what is your life after this football season and after your second master's degree look like for you? So I have two more years of eligibility. Um, you know, after this year, I'll sort of, you know, assess where I'm at, assess my situation and uh, go from there. But I don't really plan too much ahead as far as larger decisions like that. Uh but as far as smaller decisions, I just take care of what's right in front of me. And I found that as long as I keep on stacking wins every single day, when I look at the end of the year, that's 365 days of wins. And that tends to translate into either better opportunities or sort of transforming the opportunity that I'm in into a better situation. So 365 days of win or of wins, that's... An incredibly lofty goal. Um, do you always have 365 days a year of, win of wins? Like, like, and what happens if you don't get a win that day? Or is it always a win no matter what? Well, I think uh, to to quote somebody who got the same birthday as me, the the great two chains. If you woke up this morning, you winning. 
Uh, okay. You know, I, I think it, if you look at every single day as a gift, as a blessing, uh, how could it not be a win? Because either you're doing well or you didn't do well and you struggled and you got better that day because you didn't quit and you back up the next morning. Wow. So um, is there, so of all the things you're evaluating, you know, you know, past today and past this season and, and past your, your second master's degree, um, is there an NFL team, you know, you know, because obviously you're not, you're not playing the same position as LT, but like, you know, where is it you want to go? Like, you know, if, if, if football was still in the cards, where would you want to go? I mean, uh, financially, going back home to Texas wouldn't be too bad. Uh, but in all honesty, you know, I, I would play anywhere. You know, like I said, my goal is to win a Super Bowl. And uh, I know that I have the talent, drive, dedication, and ability to play uh, that that could get me in that position. Uh, and until that dream's taken away, you know, obviously it, it's still paramount to me. Uh, at the same time, uh you know, I'm very focused on school and through this this master's in legal studies, I'm focusing on entertainment law primarily and the contract side of it, because through NIL, uh, it's been an opportunity for me to get into unscripted producing and hosting. So mm -hmm. a couple of TV shows, uh, producing and hosting, and then God willing, once the strikes are over, getting into the scripted side, uh, both on the talent side, acting, voice acting and then producing. And so uh, that world is intriguing to me. And I know that I have the skill set and ability to, to grow into someone formidable in that space. And then additionally, uh, with my fellowship at the UC Investment Office and my prior interest in VC, I'm very interested in the investment space. Right now, I'm learning on the larger scale what institutional investment is and how that translates and the power of such large funds like the UC Investment Office uh, to move money and how that, you know, actually changes lives on the more micro scale uh, has been exciting for me. And I think finding ways to tie together sports, media, entertainment, music and investing uh, is, a, is a good niche for me to be in. So it sounds like football is not the be all end all for you. It sounds like well, you yeah. are not necessarily going in another direction, but it seems like you have already thought through your life plan a little bit. Well, I mean, uh, you know, a man can a man can create the plan, but but the Lord creates the steps. So, uh, none of it on earth is the be all end all for me because God willing, you know, th this isn't the end for anybody. Uh, mm -hmm. But. Uh, for me, I think keeping that perspective allows me to remain focused, remind me, uh, you know, allows me to stay encouraged uh, when things in any one of those facets uh, don't look like they're going exactly well. So in your entire career, whether it's in sports, in the classroom, doing some of the investment projects you've been working on, um, you know, or anything else, like who do you believe has made the most impact or influenced the most positive change, whether it was for you or, or to someone else or to a community, like who do you believe has made the most impact and influence changed? Uh, you're saying on my life or just, uh, Someone that you've direct you've directly um, interacted with, or or maybe just someone you've seen from afar. Right. You, know, you don't necessarily have to know them. It's just like who who are you like? Wow, that person is actually you know creating change there. Like that is a, you know that is something I aspire to be. Like who is that right. person? Well, I think that's a tough question for Bruins because there's so many world changers here. Uh, <laughs> you know, growing up, obviously Jackie Robinson has changed the world for the better. Uh, Kenny Washington changed the world for the better, you know, in a similar way on, on the football side. And then uh, you have Arthur Ashe and Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. But you also have, you know, Ann Myers Drysdale, who is the poster child and sort of the, the first and best installment of Title IX and what it could be, you know, at a time where people were fighting against progress and saying that Title IX would lead to the abandonment of of male sports, Amar mm -hmm. Drysdale proved that wrong. 
and was a great basketball player here, first woman on scholarship, and, uh, you know, to this day has been a great pillar, not only of what it means to be a Bruin, but also what it means to be an athlete, what it means to be a person who creates progress in whatever domain that they're in. And so I just take pride in being able to interact with folks such as her who have changed the world for the better. And, uh, you know, my sister plays club soccer at Stanford. Uh, the, these are all opportunities where, you know, people I love, people I interact with on a daily basis uh, have some type of, you know, opportunity owed to those who have come before them. And I don't take that lightly for my opportunities and I don't take that lightly uh, as far as being a Bruin and respecting those who have come before me. So you said you're thinking, you know, maybe if you got in the NFL, you'd want to be in Texas. So I'm assuming it's the Cowboys. Um, so you're sitting there on the Cowboys. You're the starting QB. It's the Super Bowl. You're down by five or six, you know, with about 40 seconds left on your own 10 yard line. And you had to pick your own receivers. And, and these receivers could be from any walk of life. They don't have to be athletic. This is more of a, a uh, euphemism, so to speak. Like, who would you choose on your team? Who would be your dream team? Whether, you know, it's charging down that field, you know, 90 yards in 40 seconds with no timeouts uh, or or helping influence change, you know, in your community or in the U.S. or around the world. Like, like who is your dream team of 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 yourself and your receivers that, that you would love to have. Okay. Well, it's, it's tough to ask a quarterback this cause it's, it's tough not to think practically, you know, uh, <laughs> I'm thinking about who I really want to throw a go ball to. So I got to say, I, I want Randy Moss out there. Uh, I've often always thought about this. If, Wes if Russell Westbrook played receiver, he'd be one of the best receivers of all time. So uh, give me a Bruin on the other side. <laughs> uh, definitely on the sideline. Give me my pops is the coach. Uh, he, he's all, he's always been, you know, he's the best coach I ever had. Uh, and then, uh, at slot, I got to take Jerry Rice. <laughs> and then what I, I got, I got one more receiver. Yeah. Let, let's spice it. Let, let's go Usain Bolt. It's just okay. straight down the middle. Yeah. I mean, can he still run faster than any NFL player or any person on this planet almost? Uh, yeah, I mean, he, he's probably still <laughs> running 4-4. Four, four. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, give me an example um, of just the best leader that you've encountered. You, you don't necessarily have to name that person, but like, what are the qualities that when you look at that person, you're like, oh my gosh, that's amazing what that person's doing. I want to follow in their footsteps with just how they lead their lives or, um, you know, just what they stand for. Like, it's so important. Like, what are those qualities that, that you look for and that you really want to uh, emulate and instill in yourself? Yeah, I mean, it. It's going to be a little cliche, but for me, greatest leader to ever live was, was Jesus. Uh, and, and I think uh, for me, that provides the blueprint for, you know, I believe everyone, but but how I want to live my daily life. And and, and that's to, to love the Lord with all your heart and, and love your brother like yourself. And, and uh, if you're treating everyone with the respect, uh, loyalty, uh, love, and and, and true belief in them uh, that you know that jesus showed then i believe you're doing it the right way and mm -hmm. if that is in the back of your mind and guiding each one of your interactions uh it's not gonna go south and if it does it's gonna be one-sided because what do i look like arguing with the fool you know <laughs> uh so uh I, I think going through throughout life and, and through everything that you do and reminding yourself what truly matters helps you to be at your best in that situation uh, and, and and helps you to remain true to yourself. So talking about remaining true to yourself, how important, uh, not only being true to yourself and being accountable, but being your authentic self. Cause you know, I've talked to you a couple of times over email or, or uh, you know, online and, and you seem like a genuinely authentic person. Um, are you genuinely authentic 
you know, when you're by yourself, you know, on the field, in the classroom, working with different organizations is, are you always your authentic self? Do you ever struggle? What, what does that look like for you? Uh, I, I mean, I think I'm, I'm genuinely and always the same person. Uh, I don't really feel like I have to hide anything about myself. And, and I consider that a blessing in the first place. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, definitely how the point gets across differs depending on the environment. But mm-hmm. the way that I think, uh, I feel like the way that I think is often more constant than the way that I convey it, because part of the way I think is conveying it in a way that gets through to that person. Uh, it, it, it's one thing to to say something, but it's another thing to be able to craft what you're trying to say so that whoever you're talking to understands it best. And, mm-hmm. you know, when I'm talking to guys in the locker room or on the field, uh you know, I have to get it across in a different way. And it's very mission based. You know, the mission on the football field is sometimes different than the mission in the classroom. Mm-hmm. But I, I treat both with the same focus, same respect and same competitiveness. Honestly, you know, even when I'm in class, when I answer questions, I want to have the best point of the class. But when I'm doing this interview, I want to have the best interview that culture and sports has had. Uh, it's sort of the same mentality that I have on the field. And so, okay, uh, no, who, who I am doesn't really change. I think by nature, I'm sort of a solitary person. Um, not that I don't like being around other people. It's just being around other people doesn't change like my internal brain. Who you are. Just, yeah, exactly. And, and no, that's pride. impressive. Yeah. So you don't change who you are as a person, uh, which is awesome. And, I, and I'm sure growing up, you had some perceptions and biases and values um, and, you know, fellow teammates have and people in class with you and then also coaches over time. Um, when you necessarily didn't get along with a coach at some point in your career, because I'm sure that happened because you're always your authentic self, right? Um, did you ever take into account, like, whether your actions or someone else's actions or reactions were based off of perceptions, biases, or their own values of how they grew up? Like, like, where do you think that, where do you think that looks like? And does that necessarily make all people bad that they have, you know, you know, different perceptions, biases, and values than you do? Yeah. I mean, I think part of compassion is realizing that someone else has the ex- exact amount of capacity and experience mm-hmm and thought process that goes into how they think as you have in the way that you think. And uh, I don't think that people change that much. I think in in interacting more and more with adults and and growing into one, uh, you start to see that people don't really grow up, they grow old. And a lot of the tendencies that people have at 10, 15, 20 are gonna be the tendencies (laughs) that they have 50 and 60. Uh, And realizing that there is no single perfect person on earth. Everyone more or less struggles with the same things. Uh, I think that's where you sort of find, you know, there are traits about people that make them unique, but most people are more alike than different. Uh, And and going into that sort of goes back to as a quarterback and as someone who's a problem solver, I don't have to agree with someone all the way to throw them a touchdown, or I don't have to agree with someone all the way to accomplish a piece of content with them. Uh, mm-hmm. I just have to have a mutual respect and understanding that I'll do my job, they'll do their job. And because of that, both of us are going to have the maximum amount of success that we can in whatever setting that we're working together. in. And uh, I think creating that sort of mutual respect and uh, from my perspective, uh, you know, showing love doesn't have to be a two-way street. Uh, mm-hmm. I, I don't, you know, I don't show joy and encouragement and all of that to others e- because I want them to feel good, even though I do, uh, <laughs> even though like I, I hope what I'm doing does help them do that. But it's because that's the type of person that I want to be. Okay. And I think uh, when you do it that way, it gets conveyed across better. Uh, and, and it's not something that feels tedious or feels like work just feels like you're being yourself and over time it becomes a habit and it becomes natural and it becomes your default. Mm-hmm. So talking about some other um, habits you have, um, how do you 
prioritize like self care and wellness, like not only for yourself, but even like your teammates, like, you know, because you can't go at a hundred percent all day, every day. Um, you know, that's not sustainable. So how do you prioritize that self care and wellness? It's finding pockets of time for me, um, that I like don't do anything productive. So when I'm on, like I'm really on, but when I'm off, I'm really off. Like I'll space out, I'll respond to texts and stuff like that, or I'll, I'll schedule things for work. But other than that, like I'm either playing video games, uh, I'm producing music or I'm just like chilling out watching TV. And doing things like that, that rest your body, but also rest your mind are important, uh, not only as an athlete, but as someone who's, you know, doing multiple things and, and, and doing them at a high level, because uh, there there's no shame in being unproductive for a little bit. That way, when it's time for you to be productive, you're at your best. I think where people reach burnout is they feel like... Uh, well, I'm so hungry. I'm so excited. I'm so focused. I have to make this work that they feel that they're wronging themselves or they don't allow themselves to enjoy time that's there to be enjoyed. And then another Right. thing for me, uh, especially on the scientific side is like, I always get at least eight hours of sleep. And so, uh, there, there's a point in time where it's like, it's nine o'clock, it's 10 o'clock. Like I'm not doing work past then. Uh, I'm, I'm just not, it's not reasonable because it's, it's going to be counterintuitive. Whatever work I accomplish at that time won't be done at a high level. And it also detract me from being able to do it at a high level the next morning. And so really shutting it down at nine and being like, look, I'm gonna watch some TV and then go to sleep. Uh, it is a way for me to make sure that every single morning when I wake up, I'm ready to go. I feel refreshed and I have the energy to take on the day. So would you say that your, uh, your, one of your main, you know, major focuses of self care is sleep, right? Would, but would you say it's more important mentally and emotionally or physically? All of it. Uh, you know, I remember Coach Bible, who who was my quarterback coach my first two or three years at UCLA recruiting me there, said something about the the golden hours of sleep, which is from 10 p.m. to 2, 2 a.m. He said, well, if you only get in four hours, get those four hours. And for some reason, that's always stuck in my mind. But I'm like, man, I need to go to bed at, at 10 p.m. It's, it's almost my time. And uh, that's just the time that sort of resets your clock. And it's when all of the HGH hormones in your body uh, are are produced and released. And so without that, you can't heal your brain back. You can't heal your body back. And as the quarterback, those are the two things you need. Uh, and then in general, uh, when when you're not getting sleep, you're not your best self the next day. Things that are trivial, you know, you go back to, to eighth or ninth grade where things that are trivial feel like feel like they're the end of the world. Uh, your, your hormones are all messed up to, to where you're, you're anxious for no reason and uh, you can't operate in a way uh, that you're at your best. And so sleep Mm-hmm. is Mm-hmm. extremely important. And I think it's something that, uh, you know, we're progressing towards as a society where we, we understand that uh, lack of sleep is not an indicator of success. And like going hard all night and, and doing all that is not the indicator. It's more, oh, you got nine hours, like you'll probably have a better day. Wow, that that's very impressive. And and thank you for sharing that because you know, a lot of people do think that perfection is, you know, you know, working as hard as you possibly can and and making the best uh Uh, you know, finishing the best paper possible or, or like, you know, I have to read through this playbook, but if they're, you know, spending all night doing that, uh, how do they have the energy the next day to do what they need to do? Or, or if they're reading a playbook on a Friday night and you have a Saturday game, uh, are they actually going to be ready for the game or are they going to be worse off from trying to perfect, uh, you know, remembering everything from the playbook and, and you Yeah, I mean, bring up a great point. if you, if you got a Saturday game and you're trying to study the playbook Friday night, you might as well just cancel There's that. some other issues You ain't, at you play. ain't ready. You ain't ready. <laughs> Chase, thank you so much for taking the time to meet with us today. Um, I do have two questions before you go. Um, the first is, is um, who's a better collegiate athlete? I know, I know your sister's playing, uh, you know, club soccer, uh, but who's the better collegiate athlete between the two of you?
I, think I know Rose, she's smarter than you. Yeah, yeah. I think Rose <laughs> probably the better student. I, I think I got her on the athlete. I'm an honest person. I gas her up for no reason. <laughs> and and my final, player. she is a great player though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And 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 this this question's a little more serious, and you could take a moment to think about it. Um, do you have a, a final statement to make to any athlete, coach, you know, supporting staff, uh, high performance directors? uh athletic directors or or gms or anything else uh or even the athlete support structure like parents and families um you know what final statement would you have to make to them uh whether it's here in the u.s or anywhere else around the world yeah i mean i think for the parents they and guardians uh, of, of athletes they play probably the most integral role uh even during college maybe even especially during college uh don't treat your your son or daughter as the player that they are. Treat them as the child or, or, or as the person that you're responsible to take care of. Because uh, trust me, especially once they get to college, they're getting treated enough as a player, um, like like too much uh, and not as much as the young man or young woman that they are. So I think from the parent's perspective, that's important to remember. And then uh, from the admin perspective, from you know, the general college athletics landscape perspective, uh, athletes uh, in the next few years are going to have access to to more media rights than they've ever had before. And the schools that adopt policies and implement programs that make this situation most advantageous for athletes are going to end up seeing the biggest return on investment. Because as soon as you incentivize the talent pool more to generate uh, media revenue, you're going to generate more revenue for everyone. Right. And so understanding that giving athletes a larger slice of the pie uh, is just going to grow the pie for everyone else. And so, uh, you know, taking care of athletes is taking care of yourselves, even in the cynical version. And then on the optimistic version, uh, if you're working in athletics and you're not doing it for the athletes, why are you there? Exactly. Thank you again, Chase. Uh, good luck at your game this weekend. And I um, uh, hope to see you again on the show soon. Thank you so much. I appreciate you having me. God bless you. And that's a wrap for this week's episode of the Culture and Sports Podcast. We hope that this episode has started an internal dialogue or even one with your team about the importance of leadership and organizational culture. If you'd like to learn more about culture and sports, the Culture and Sports Podcast, or other programs, Go to cultureandsports.com, where there is a wealth of resources, articles, research, podcasts, video shows, webinars, and courses. And don't forget to connect with us on social media, on Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, YouTube, and LinkedIn at Culture and Sports, and on Twitter at Culture in Sport. Thank you for tuning in to the Culture and Sports podcast.